So Ed, tell me, how how did you come to your career in aerospace? Well, certainly as a youth, I was very interested in aircraft, building models, studying aircraft, and of course, I was a World War II kid, and aircraft were so uh, viable in that period. And um, after, uh, and I grew up in the, in Manhattan, in New York City. After uh, uh, graduating from Par Memorial Academy, famous at least for one basketball player, <laughs> uh, I went into the Air Force. And in the Air Force, I was uh, trained as a jet aircraft mechanic. And I worked on B-52s and F-89s and a variety of odds and ends. <clears throat> I left the Air Force a month early to uh, start the uh, fall semester at Indiana Institute of Technology and I graduated from there with my uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And I was looking for the, uh, the best weather in the country that had aerospace opportunities. And after graduating, drove to California and started to look around. Um, the timing was not quite perfect, and I ended up taking an engineering job with the state of California. And it was an interesting enough job. It was uh, the design and economic analysis of the uh, Feather River Project, the California new water system that was just bonded at that time. But uh, aerospace uh, was in my blood, and uh, a year and a half later, after sending resumes out to a number of uh, uh, companies and interviewing, I interviewed in Downey. And after walking through the plant and smelling the JP4 running <laughs> in the yes. engines across the street and everything, I said, this is it. Oh. it this, this is what I'm looking for. So there I joined them on that February 18th and uh, stayed with that laboratory team until um, May 30th, 2008. So that gave me an opportunity to look at an enormous amount of stuff and play with the toys. Ed and I have shared a lot in terms of this site and location, and we had a chance to talk before uh, uh, before this, this presentation about some of the more exciting challenges that the Apollo brought to us. Uh, your first assignment here, what, uh, what were you involved in? What did they put you on? Well, I was assigned to the Environmental Control and Life Support Laboratory, which was uh, created to qualify, certify all of the things that supported the crew's life aboard the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, so everything from uh, the uh, environmental control system, uh, the waste management system, uh, drinking water, uh, food, and a few other things that fell under some very specialized zero-gravity test work. In the uh, early stages of the program, uh, we worked from a set of performance requirements that the customer gave us. This is usually NASA's idea of what they want to accomplish. Uh, you know, we want to... It was easy for the president to say, we're going to put three men on the moon, and we'll do that in 10 years. But it was up to us, the contractors, to figure out, how does that actually get done? And how do you actually build the hardware that's going to, to make that happen? What can you think of in terms of the most challenging of the projects, the problems we had to confront? I think they big challenge was to create a 
command and control system that could plan and monitor and integrate these contractors and the flow down and assembly of thousands of products from all over the country. Uh, I don't think we ever had a project of that magnitude to develop a system of that magnitude to do it. And I feel that that <clears throat> was an important uh, behind the scenes spin-off of the program that provided everybody uh, the guidance to achieve the program uh, requirements and the requirements slow down that NASA gave us. I was always amazed at our management skills to drive this ship through the unknown with, uh, I don't know, I think I heard we had 30, 35,000 people on this site. Just imagine everybody under control. And most of the time under control. Most of the time. The, uh, the one thing I recall from, from all of the time that we spent on, uh, on the Apollo was this sense of belonging to a team. Uh, you had to be a team. But like any team, there were their ups and downs. There were the team players and the not team players. Is there one person in your experience on Apollo and your career that stands out as someone very special, special in terms of you or the program? I would probably have to point to the director of the engineering laboratories at that time, a guy by the name of Harry Motion Rose. And uh, Harry was a uh, hands-on type of director. He could show up anywhere at any time. He ran what I considered a, a well-organized and tight ship. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things he was famous for is he, he would walk all the aisles of our engineering offices and that and observe things and he would write out these little notes and put them on people's desk which we got to call motiograms. <coughs> he had a, a great sense of humor and early in my career I ended up with an R&D assignment. It's a little bit off of Apollo but I got this assignment to design and build for UCLA a bladder temperature controller, which introduces me to the life science people and the medical people, which I stayed in very close contact with my jobs over the many years. And uh, uh, Harry Motion Rose would come by and What's the status on the bladder chip? <laughs> and uh, I got one fantastic piece of advice for him one time. He sat in on a group meeting, a design review, and uh, we got everything reviewed and all the requirements set. And when we left and we were walking back to our offices, he said, remember, Ed, you don't have to win every point. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I thought, was one of the finest pieces of advice I ever got. So that when I'm in meetings and developing this interpersonal relationship that gets things done, I try to give away every point I don't need. Harry was one of my favorite at the, at the uh, lab as well. And to help paint another picture for you, I want you to imagine, some of you might remember a character by the name of Mr. Jeeves, a very prim British butler type. Harry was like Mr. Jeeves. Harry wore a suit with a vest 
and would wear a hat as well. Now think about this in 1960s. A gentleman, a true gentleman in every aspect and sense of the word. We lost Harry uh, several years ago. But I'm, I'm glad for this comment, Ed, because his daughter is still here in Southern California, and I've talked with her on several occasions. And I think we might invite her to come in and share some, some of the stories about her father and some of the rest of us from the old lab days yeah. who remember Harry. Thank you. Thank you for that. The life sciences were very critical to the uh, development of a lot of the hardware. And uh, as we were talking earlier, one we don't talk about too much, but was really a nemesis for us in the, our design challenge, was the waste management system, of which you have played a role. Uh, the portions that we can talk about, would you share some of those? <clears throat> As I uh, mentioned, our job was to uh, qualify and certify that these pe pieces actually worked, piece by piece, assembly by assembly, up to the whole vehicle. And so uh, during the course of my hollow days from uh, running uh, whole vehicle tests, uh, they assigned me to take on this project to verify that the waste management system works in zero gravity. To this point, <laughs> no considerations had been given to it, but they had designed and built uh, a fecal canister, and they had designed and built a, a urine receptacle, and they had designed and built a vacuum system. <clears throat> so it was my job with engineering to design and build a flight test uh, structure with all of the subsystem installed, instrumented, and operational, <clears throat> which we effectively did in our laboratory. And then I did a flight test on it at 25,000 feet in one of our large altitude chambers to make sure that it would operate on that differential pressure level, that it would function, and everything worked fine. <laughs> then I took it to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and got it installed on a KC-135, which is a, a, a large four-engine jet aircraft, uh, probably a similar airframe to the Boeing 707 of that type. This aircraft was uh, uh, gutted of everything inside except for maybe 20 seats in the back end. And uh, it had been totally padded, floor and ceilings and everything, in a white foam, rubber, and hard surface padding. And it had built in uh, high-intensity uh, lighting systems for photography work. <clears throat> uh, this aircraft, they would uh, they would uh, take this aircraft up and they would uh, fly it in what was called a parabola. And a parabola is a loop-de-loop -loop that for 30 seconds on the upswing you get essentially a zero gravity environment. <clears throat> so we went out flight testing this for a week or two, trying everything we could under the sun to form all the tests we could and retry them and retry them. And then took the data and brought everything back to Downey, went into the chief engineer's meeting and my opening statement was, nothing worked, not even the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> anyway, from that point on, I think I worked that for about a year and a half. And uh, 
bit by bit, uh, we worked all of those pieces and parts and got them finally close enough. They were not very good uh, service. And uh, one of the astronauts I had worked with many times in the plant, Bill Anders, who flew Apollo 8 around the moon, uh, was back down in the laboratory after that flight. And he said to me, Ed, the slave galleries had better uh, waste management systems. <laughs> <clears throat> they had to have a very bad incident uh, aboard the spacecraft that cost them a, at least a day to clean up. So <coughs> it was a good system. Obviously, the waste management was one of the biggest challenges we had. Um, well, let's just say the next time you use the restroom, imagine what it would be like if you had no gravity. <laughs> and you'll get a sense for that. When we did the space shuttle program, and I went to the uh, uh, engineering kickoff uh, briefing, uh, the chief engineer looked at me and he said, we are outsourcing the waste management system. <laughs> <coughs> let Mikey do it. Yeah, let somebody else do it and take all the flack. <laughs> Ed, uh, the comment you made about Bill, and by the way, Bill Anders on Apollo 8 was the astronaut who took that iconic photograph of the Earth with the, uh, the moon in the foreground. Just the most incredible photograph ever taken. Um, you had a chance to work with many of the astronauts during your career here on Apollo. Would you share some background and some stories about some of the more notable? Well, Roger Chaffee was a, uh, a young astronaut and uh, on the uh, part of the Corps, <clears throat> and the astronauts were assigned elements of the spacecraft to become expertise on. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the engineering development setups that I had covered the uh, coal plates and their fluid circulating water glycol systems. The coal plates have all the electronics mounted on each plate, and they absorb the heat out of the electronics. <clears throat> the water glycol then is pumped down into the service module, and it goes out and flows through these external radiators that uh, eject this excess heat into space. Uh, it also keeps excess heat through the heat exchangers for the cabin air and things of that nature. <clears throat> so Chaffee wanted to become an expert on this subsystem. And as I developed and, and worked on it, and things were always changing. Uh, he would come by regularly and look at the latest upgrades, this, that, and the other. Uh, as part of Apollo 1, uh, Chaffee, uh, with that team, uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, were also, uh, I conducted a flight test with them aboard a laboratory Apollo in the vacuum chamber, big vacuum chamber facility in Downey, <clears throat> in which we were able to simulate uh, the going aboard the vehicle, all of the vehicle pre-launch activities, 100% uh, uh, pure oxygen, and uh, the lock-in of the cabin door, the securing of the chamber, <clears throat> and we we're able to do, through our pumping systems, a launch uh, pressure curve that they would see on the way out to space. <clears throat> the importance of this uh, 
was to verify that the environmental control system would properly operate. It would depressurize the cabin as the spacecraft rose, and eventually it would stabilize the cabin at five pounds per square inch. Uh, within the cabin, uh, there was an air recirculation system, and the system uh, was moved through activated charcoal and filters and that, and what it did, it purified the environment uh, as you flew the mission. <clears throat> it was uh, that system worked very, very good uh, as far as we could see in numerous tests until uh, another flight test and um, um, Bill Anders was aboard with two of our pilot technology people for a day's flight in it. <clears throat> and on board this Apollo, which is tight as the front closet, uh, he's up there, he's punching buttons, he's kicking and doing everything. He's, he's, he's rough on the environment. But thank goodness, the system that purifies the air has two compartments, an A and a B. And the purpose of that is that you can open one compartment if the spacecraft was evacuated and everybody was in suits and change a filter. What he discovered is he could get both of them open at the same time. And if they were in space, suited, and the pressure was low or non-existent, that was it. They were dead. So that was maybe one of the very important discoveries we made in this test. We ran this test with pilot technology uh, group for 14 solid days to verify that the system would adequately perform for long, twice as long as a lunar shot. And uh, for all practical purposes, uh, I think we drove out almost uh, all the problems. <clears throat> I remember one of the flights that I was conducting, one of the pilot technology guy uh, hollered to me, as a test conductor, he said, TC, I'm getting sparking on my biomedical harness. And he's in a pure oxygen environment. And I shouted the correct circuit breaker number to one of the electrical control panel operators and hit it. They are there breathless. And he comes back on and he says, hey, it stopped, TC. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very scary moment. Unfortunately, on January 27th, 1967, yes. the crew of Apollo 1, the same astronauts you had worked with, were lost. Lost. It was a terrible can you, hit. Can you describe where you were and your feelings about that day? Well, that had to be the very lowest point of my career. Uh, when you lose a team like that, that you work with so carefully, uh, there's, there's no coming back from it. Uh, I, I will never forget that team. Yeah. Tough, tough, tough guys, smart guys. Physically, they could run me into the ground, and I was in fairly good shape. <laughs> Aerospace, especially back then and still, is a very dangerous business. And the crew of Apollo 1 knew that full well. And we often talk about the cost of a program such as Apollo. What did it cost us to go to the moon? Well, in this case of Apollo 1, it was the ultimate price that was paid by three astronauts. But there were many other 
dues to be paid over the course of the program. And everyone who was involved at some point in some time paid a price. In some cases it was health, poor, bad health, heart attacks, stress. It was um, marriages, relationships. We each had our own price to pay. And as I mentioned for myself, on uh, May 1st of 1967, right after the Apollo 1, I was in one of the labs performing a uh, test and I paid a price of which Ed was a witness to. Ed, would you share the description of what happened that day? Well, we were, we were working in building 288, our main laboratory building, and uh, I was on one side of a hallway with escrow on both sides, and the side I was on, I, was, I think I was working on a uh, space suit umbilical, and suddenly I heard a huge boom, and immediately dropped what I was doing, and raced around the end of the uh, escrows, and there lying on the floor was none other than Jerry. And what had happened was he had been running some tests uh, that required very, very precision uh, pressure readings. And the uh, uh, pressure gauge of that day, uh, which we call Wallace and Tiernan gauges, were absolute pressure gauges. Uh, that is, the zero on those gauge was zero, no atmospheric pressure at all. Uh, there was a technician standing there who was just stunned because he had had an error in adjusting uh, the pressure systems. And this Wallace and Tiernan gauge, which is about this big around, and it's like a deep pot uh, behind it for all the mechanisms inside, uh, had blown out the whole front of the gauge. I don't know what the pressure was within this pot, but it was enough to put the gauge out. And there was Jerry standing in front of it. And the first thing I could do was uh, get the uh, 911 help call in, which uh, we had our own emergency teams, firefighters and everything, and they were there in a matter of a couple of minutes. And then the story leaves my view. <coughs> Unbeknownst to me at the time, I, not being able to see anything uh, and being in shock, I felt this large hand on my shoulder and heard this voice in my ear, relax and fall back, I have you, I've got you. It wasn't until several, about a year later that I found out that it had the, it belonged to a, a gentleman who we had just hired as a technician at the facility and he had just returned as a medic from Vietnam and he was able to stabilize me until the EMTs got there and I was able to spend the next six months in rehabilitation and, and so I. And then, thank you for that. So we all paid our prices and but the costs, I think we all agree, were well worth it. I've commented recently on the Apollo 1 tragedy and the crew loss that had it not been for the loss of that crew, we may never have gone to the moon. We would not have gone to the moon because that accident, that fire, if it had occurred on the actual mission, subsequent mission, that would have been the end of the program and we still would have lost a crew.
So, but there were other aspects of the program. It never ended. That just continued on and on. And so after these, the following year, I'm back to work. The program has moved on and we are preparing for the first Apollo missions, Apollo 8 and Apollo 9, 10 and 11. The show must go on. And we have more and more problems every day to solve. We did. You were involved also in uh, some of the work that was going on at the same time down in Seal Beach at uh, our satellite programs? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, our satellite programs didn't kick in until uh, the 70s. Okay. Did a lot of test work um, on uh, GPS, mm -hmm. uh, the Block 1 series that proved the capability of the uh, uh, navigation system. And of course, I'm not sure what we would do today without GPS. <laughs> uh, wouldn't even be Anybody want to give up their cell phones or their uh, <laughs> GPS locators? It was full of wonderful uh, programs like that. That's, that's what, that was what the challenge was. Every day you never knew what new and exciting thing would drop in your lap. And I had a lot drop in. <laughs> and I'd like to remind the audience that uh, we had a different toolbox back then. I was recently giving a presentation and I mentioned how we didn't have really computers like we have today. Our computers were rooms away and you use cards to talk to the computers and things like that. But we had our tools and our tools were the brain, the pencil, and I used this term yesterday at a presentation. We had slip sticks. Does anybody remember what a slip stick was? Few and far between, but uh, I like to say that we built the Apollo program on slide rules and three by five cards, and I still have my three by five cards. <laughs> oh, don't forget the pocket protectors. Yes, <laughs> with the red, red pen, black pen, black pencil. <laughs> yep. In fact, I had a little short slide rule that fit in there also. Yeah, the little six inch. I love that little six yeah. inch slide rule. Because so you nice. never tell when you're out on the job and somebody, somebody says, uh, you know, uh, uh, what kind of wall thickness do I need on this tubing or uh, uh, this, that, and the other. And you could quickly run the numbers and say, with my factor safety, this is what I need. As we get down in the lab, you don't normally take a really solid uh, slide rule with you, but close enough for government work. <laughs> Working in the laboratories was was kind of different from some of the other aspects of, of, of the program. What what do you remember most about uh, the laboratory environment in, as a workplace back then? Well, the laboratory is a very diverse population. Uh, you have your engineers, but you had this large technician force, and uh, we also had uh, a, a great fabrication shop, machine shop, sheet metal, uh, welding, and all of that. So you could design at your desk, throw eight and a half by 11 prints into the shop in light of a few questions, a little hand waving, and you could build things overnight. Uh, the team work and the diversity of skills there uh, are, are really unbelievable. Uh, whether it was in the uh, uh, material and properties laboratories where every kind of chemistry and analysis tool existed to structural labs, environmental labs, uh, cryogenic and uh, pressurization labs, uh, uh, hydraulic laboratories, uh, uh, an ordnance pyrotechnics laboratory. Uh, everything you could possibly think of was there. 
And if it wasn't, you could sub it somewhere. So the tools were amazing. Most people think of work as a nine to five job. You get up in the morning, you get ready to go to work, you spend your day at work, you have lunch, and you come home, and that's your day. How was that for you and Apollo? Apollo had long days, and crises made him extra long. Um, <clears throat> there was a contamination in uh, the Building 290 clean room of one of the Apollo uh, vehicles, and the vehicle had had all of the wiring harnesses installed, which went in first. Then all the plumbing was installed. And however it was discovered, they found that the plumbing was contaminated. And the contamination was identified as to its properties by our materials and processes laboratories. And they pulled together a team uh, to review the problem. And when I left that team, my job was to design and build a flushing system of the Apollo installed tubing but it had to be sub-atmospheric pressure to the fluid because if there was a leak anywhere, they couldn't afford to have the leak occur within the structure. <clears throat> and I think I started uh, like on a Wednesday with the design work. By Saturday, I had parts there from all over the country. And Normally, and I spent a lot of time waiting for parts order. I said, holy mackerel, how did you get this stuff in? I've been trying to get some of these uh, 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 pumps for months, and I've still got some on order. And here they are. And they said, oh, our, uh, our vice president of purchasing or whatever called up the president of the company and said, hey, I need them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so it all came in. And we put it all together over the weekend. And by Monday, we're able to bring it over to Building 290 and spend a day getting it hooked up and checked out. And I got it started close to close to close of business. And I was supposed to be relieved at maybe 10 or 11 o'clock that night, and nobody showed. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked that job through the night and finally had a, Another engineer relieved me the following morning, and the supervisor was very unhappy uh, uh, that I spent all night there. But I don't think he quite realized the urgency of the situation that a manufactured Apollo was under such critical conditions. Because imagine the cost we sprang a leak of an acid type solution inside this structure, it could be. Well, catastrophic. It was not uncommon during the Apollo program for stories like this. You worked the problem, yeah. and it was whatever it was, whatever it took. So when the time did come to go home to the family and the wife, you, you really relished that opportunity to take a deep breath and a sigh. But one of the shocks when I first met this gentleman was to find out that many times when he went home, it was because in his spare time, he happened to be mayor of La Mirada. Oh. Oh. Would you please yes. share that, some of that with us? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, when I uh, moved into city government as a member of council of the city of La Palma. It was uh, 1971, and the big push was over at that point. Uh, we were just then, at that point, trying to keep things stable. We were proposing the space shuttle, which was proposal time. And 
<clears throat> suddenly I had all this spare time, right? I was down to maybe a 40 or 45 hour a week. Yeah, a short week. A short week. And La Palma uh, was a brand new city. It had just been uh, started uh, in uh, 1965. And uh, it had all been dairy land and agricultural. And so we got in on the ground floor of this uh, burgeoning new community. And we were active like in the homeowners association and everything. And uh, you start, or at least I did, I started looking at some of their design decisions for the city. And uh, I ended up uh, serving as president of the homeowners association. And then there was a vacancy and a lot of people urged me to run for a council seat. So in 1971, I ran the seat in the council and I stayed on that council until 1984. And it was a tremendous transition period for the city, uh, going from, from new housing complexes and uh, uh, building the parks and uh, building our major uh, commercial areas and that and being part of the person who laid down the design requirements rather than hand waving this stuff to the staff, which quite often in my mind is the weak link in running most of government. Uh, the leadership in all too many cases do not have the skills or the capability of defining the problems and defining the solutions. And that's something I've certainly learned from my aerospace experience. We uh, frequently in the business would have a, a condition where there would be some problem that would just pop up all of a sudden. And uh, the term that was used was by upper management would be, uh, we need a tiger team. <laughs> We need a tiger team to go handle this. And usually what that meant is uh, you need to bring together a small group that can go tackle it. And my first experience in participating in a tiger team was uh, a basic rule of tiger teams, which is if you want the best tiger team, you find the busiest people and put them on the job. And certainly, I agree, this is one of the many lessons learned that uh, that's what it takes sometimes to solve the millions and millions of problems that we have. Um, kind of as a summary before we'll take some questions, uh, you mentioned uh, a lesson learned. What is your main takeaway from your experience in aerospace and the Apollo? For you personally, and what would you offer to the future generation as a lesson learned? Well, I used to say my motto was work, work, work. <laughs> I discovered that you do that, you end up with some spare time that you can really have fun playing. Um, the, the, the program I felt as a career gave you a deep understanding in how to think and precisely plan what's in front of you, whether it's uh, uh, planning by schedule, planning by cost, planning by technology, jumps you have to make. And that becomes part of everyday life uh, in your thinking process which not everybody agrees with. You know, what's the old saying? Well, he's an engineer. You know, you're in one of these groups and these discussions are going by and it's, oh, he's an engineer. <laughs> and uh, actually, I take a little pride in that. <laughs> the last question for you. Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, boot on the moon. Where were you and what did you feel? Well, I was at home, and it was absolutely fantastic, the achievement 
unbelievable when I personally realized the thousands of pieces and the amount of energy involved to do the job, and it essentially worked like a charm. <clears throat> I'll give you a little side uh, story on Apollo 11. A week or so before Apollo 11 left, I was uh, zero gravity flight testing out of Patrick Air Force Base on uh, the Florida coast there. And uh, we were flying two missions. One mission was by trying to develop a water quality device. The water, the hydrogenated water on board Apollo uh, left a great deal to be desired, as the astronauts would tell us. So did a lot of work trying to get those things to provide a flavorful taste to the water. But in front of me, uh, further up the aircraft, was a mock-up of a lunar lander. And on board was Buzz Aldrin. And he was fully spacesuited and pressurized. And he was practicing walking up and down that ladder, which he would be doing in a week or week and a half. And uh, that, it was fantastic to meet him and uh, then watch him performing. So what the aircraft commander would do, he'd fly north up the coast doing zero gravities. Then he would turn around and he'd come south doing one-sixth of a gravity. <laughs> lunar gravity, and during the lunar gravities, of course, there was Buzz Aldrin <laughs> climbing up, climbing down. <laughs> so it was so impressive then to sit at the TV and watch them coming down that ladder. It looks like they did it in a studio, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've met people who tell us that. Yeah, frequently. Yeah. <laughs>